Right, our next speaker is uh, Rajat Sharif, who is CEO and founder of Pharma Trust. Yes, thank you. By the way, I'm not a doctor, even though it says it on one knee. Uh, I'll take the credit for it anyway. So, um, thank you so much. Uh, Pharma Trust was set up three years ago. Our initial aim was to actually eliminate counterfeit drugs from the supply chain. Um, the numbers are quite staggering. It's a $200 billion industry and about a million people die worldwide. Uh, some of you may have even seen the uh, report in The Guardian yesterday which uh, said doctors were worried about 250,000 women a year being infected by counterfeit drugs just here in the UK. Um, the Express newspaper actually reported earlier this month that because of a no-deal Brexit, uh, Britain would be flooded with counterfeit drugs. So many people seem to think that this is a problem over there in Asia or Africa. But what you have to realize is it affects every country and all members of society, whether you're rich and poor. So <clears throat> what do we do? Uh, Pharma Trust is a blockchain AI company uh, which provides services to the pharmaceutical and healthcare sector. Um, essentially, we are built to, uh, of course, um, eliminate waste, um, create efficiencies, and make sure there is availability of healthcare products when they're needed, where they're needed. Ultimately, it's about consumer safety. What we operate in is uh, four main areas. We operate in the pharmaceutical tracking and data services. So we will track medicines from the point of production to the point of consumption and every data point in between. And we also do that for medical devices. Believe it or not, everyone concentrates on medicines, but there are a lot of hip transplants and other expensive implants that are actually now available on a counterfeit basis. Um, we also uh, do clinical trial services. As you know, this seems to be a lot in the news simply because regulators are concerned with whether companies, particularly outsourced companies overseas, have followed processes and procedures that satisfy the quality <coughs> that are needed by the regulators, uh, perhaps in the US or here in Europe. Um, and finally, we also operate in the CGT or personalized medicine space. So this is a space where sample, a DNA sample or a blood sample is taken from you and a uh, specific treatment is made uh, to uh, treat you. Um, so where are we in terms of our setup? We are actually in the process of installing our uh, product. Um, we have been working on it, as I said, for approximately three years. It's already installed in one of our partners in the US called Systec One, um, and their clients can quite easily move on to our blockchain service. We also just finished a feasibility study in Mongolia. Um, and now that's making its way through various processes to install our system countrywide. Um, the reason being, we take a mobile first uh, approach, so we have a very cost effective solution rather than the old traditional servers and scanner processes that, that have been used. Um, we have found actually that the US FDA and the emerging markets are so much more accepting and pro-blockchain than perhaps some of our um, European, uh, shall we say, regulators. So for example, um, the CGT or personalized medicine um, solution that we developed was actually for a very large uh, German client who was hinted at by the FDA to actually use blockchain for the CGT processing. Um, we're also part of the um, FDA DSCSEA pilot program as a consortium with some other partners which should be decided on at the beginning of April. Um, and of course uh, our partners in Oracle are here, we are also the healthcare lead for the Oracle uh, retail blockchain. Now there is a lot of talk about theoretical um, concepts in terms of what can blockchain do, uh, what are the issues, uh, how can we improve it, and how can we get people to actually use it? Well, in our view, it's actually people need to try it. People need to actually see which solutions are out there and which solutions are actually working. 
what we struggle with here at uh, Farmer Trust is the ability to find the right people, particularly in the UK, who are willing to test out our system, which are working, which are actually installed in other corporate uh, organisations elsewhere in the world. Um, we really think blockchain will fundamentally change not just healthcare, but society generally, and the benefits are here now. We're one of the few companies headquartered here in the UK which has the solution that meets the requirements for healthcare and pharmaceutical. And as far as I understand it, we're the only blockchain company approved under the FMD regulations to provide uh, uh, regulated services uh, throughout Europe. So um, if there are questions, or if there are, we're more than happy to tell you what our practical experiences. And the main learning that we have had is that from a corporate perspective, either we need to reduce people's costs um, or create efficiencies, or from a society point of view, show how we are saving lives um, and making a big impact. And we can do that right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Right. Um, I think now we've got uh, Phil Stradling and Philip Gregg from NHS England who wanted to make a couple of contributions, and then we'll move on to questions from the audience. So, do you just want to sort of say who you are again? Yes, so I'm uh, Phil Stradling. I work for NHS England, which is the national commissioning body. I work on the architecture team, so I've been advising uh, Matt Hancock on the long-term plan on interoperability standards. Um, at the moment, our strategy is very much as Navin um, indicated. We want to break down the silos, we want to empower the patients so they can be as much a source of information as well as a consumer of information, as well as enabling the sharing of information to follow the patients, where the, ch the patient is referred by a GP to a hospital and then onward to specialist services in the community. The data needs to follow the, the patient so that all the clinicians are informed, they can make better decisions. Um, as Manny alluded to um, in his talk, as we employ uh, professionals, whether they're doctors or nurses or allied health professionals, we need to have a much more modern and mobile workforce because of the challenges in retaining and recruiting um, and knowing the qualifications of, of, of our workforce. Um, so the sort of uh, capability that Manny was outlining starts to indicate, um, as I think Navin was alluding to, how we can start to see some building blocks um, the challenge is, um, as the speakers have, alluded, as have already said, is you can see something working, but how do you scale it up? How do you actually get procurement? And what we've seen is um, a nervousness of we can cheer something on uh, at the national <coughs> level. We can equally, as Ben Goldacre uh, was, was, uh, was up on screen earlier, call out this looks like snake oil um, with, because of all the Bitcoin and the hype uh, in the marketplace. So how do we overcome the nervousness that is generated because of that hype? Um, so, so that when people do a procurement, they don't run back and start to build bigger databases behind bigger firewalls, which is the natural tendency that, uh, that you see. Um, so we can, we've worked with many of the um, industry partners. Um, I can see Accenture and Oracle on the screen there. We've also worked with IBM and Microsoft, as well as startups. Uh, forgive me, we haven't worked with Farmer Trust specifically. Let's change that quickly. But we, get, <laughs> we, we, we get the drift of what you're saying. So we've got to start in some place and say what, what, are the, what is the meaningful way of building on the initial evidence we see that a blockchain can provide the basis of, of a, work, a workable solution having greater trust in our doctors, Manny's point. If we've got trusted doctors, can we also have trusted drugs? Uh, which is Raj's point, and, and better trials. Um, so so it's, it's, it's this scale out um, is the issue that I would put to um, where I'm seeking some answers, uh, which I was trying to sort of raise in the earlier point about the task force. Um, because to address any one of our challenges, whether it's the drug supply or the doctor, the trusting doctors, we need the support of other parties. To me, it looks like from, an, from NHS England, 
as a single national arms length body, we can't solve the problem. An individual hospital, an individual health economy, whether it's in London or in Liverpool, can't necessarily solve the problem. Um, so this is where we need a better articulation of how, 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 how these sort of solutions scale out. Um, so that's where I would like to um, uh, pose that challenge. And then, Phil, do you want to cover immunisations and... Yeah, so <clears throat> we absolutely understand where this helps for identity and the supply chain, whether that's drugs or whatever that is. There's also the software supply chain. Someone's mentioned Smart on Fire. I implement systems. I need to trust that those systems are not going to harm the patient. So we're also looking at things like immunisation of children. So there are events that happen. You are born. You have examinations. You have development checks. You have... And this is all in a distributed fashion. It's not necessarily in the NHS. There are other providers of this, and councils are starting to provide these services. There I say, you know, there's a possibility for franchising some of these things, but we need this architecture. And what we need is we need governments to do what governments do, to set standards and regulate. We drive on the left-hand side of the road. George Stevenson came years ago about the, the Railways Act. You know, if you ask the canal owners, do they think the railways were a good idea? No. But we have to set the standards so that we can then allow this vibrant market to flourish. We can't tokenise healthcare through these blockchains as well. We need that to flourish. But we need governments to set those standards. But as we mentioned before, there's England, then there's the four nations, Estonia are doing things, Dubai are doing things, this is international, we need these fabrics, whatever you want to call them, to interoperate so we don't create these lock-ins and we have a Facebook and a Twitter or an Apple or whatever, we've got to make sure that governments do what governments do, they set the standards and regulate and allow us in that market to, to enable and not locked into suppliers because whilst people talk about the data locking us in, these platforms would lock us in as well and there are, there are suppliers that will want us to lock into platforms so we have to go to them irrespective of the, the data and things like that. So again, that's my, my kind of plea is that we set ourselves off on the right foot so that we, we, we get that. Okay, I thank you Phil for that contribution. Uh, maybe we can ask our panel to respond to that initially before we go to, board, uh, to the audience for general questions. Just one thing about the question, on the point of standards, it's also quite interesting whether you try to apply those nationally or internationally, because it's often been said, what's the point of having a set of standards which only applies to the UK if other countries apply different standards? But perhaps our panel uh, have uh, some kind of... So we, we don't uh, do personal data except for in the CGT side, and we rely on our client to actually deal with that side of it. But in terms of product data, what we find is there are some standards out there. Uh, we take a blockchain neutral approach because I think we're in the nature, nascent stages of blockchains. It's a bit like 1998 for the internet. You know, you had Yahoo, Ask Jeeves, all the other search engines, and then, of course, Google dominated it all. And I, I, I hear what Philip is trying to say in terms of preventing that happening when it comes to blockchains. So we take a blockchain neutral approach, and we do that by building blockchain interconnectors, but we also do it by following what uh, international standards there are out there already. I mean, Global One standards are generally reasonably well accepted in most countries now in terms of product data and what data one needs. But in the way we build our solutions, we always allow for flexibility for our clients to choose which platform uh, to move to later on. So I, th I think it's very valid that we should have a competitive landscape when it comes to blockchains. I think it's a very valid point. We do need standards, but I think it's also interesting to note that there are standards out there because of the point you're making, which is actually there needs to be international standards, not national standards. We've already got it for the DSCSEA in, in the US. We've already got it here in Europe with the FMD rules, and we also have the assistance of Global One standards as well in terms of the types of data we want to collect. But these standards sometimes are set by commercial considerations and entities taking whatever is uh, required for expedience, which then is later formalized. But I accept if we can have standards that are international, then it helps everybody. Okay, thanks, Roger. Uh, Manuel? Uh, yeah, so, yeah I, I agree. So we've been building on open standards, and we've taken that from day one. We're very open in fact. And when you come to commercial organisations, they find that very strange, because the first question is, what's the business model? What's the commercial driver? And then once they start to understand it, you can say, well, 
in healthcare, an ecosystem, the patient should be the winner, but you can still win and everyone can win. And, and you're kind of flipping this model of, let's hold all, all the data and mine it, as opposed to let's distribute it and share it, and everyone can, can, can win. So we take a really open, we, we're building on one ledger, but as a, as a company, we're, we're going to be agnostic if they meet standards, and we're, we're using W3C standards, and it's published because we want to cooperate with an Oracle or a Microsoft or an IBM. So I want this wallet to, because it's the GMC has a Microsoft hosting in Asia, or ourselves, or, or whatever, or whoever, can, can all. And, but the risk being here with open source, and, I, and, I, and I'm not picking up on Microsoft, but you can look at Active Directory, that's built on LDAP Open Protocol. They have 85% of the market because they extended and embraced it, like, and now everyone else is extinguished. And that's the danger we shouldn't get in. You've got open standards, but then how do you make sure it doesn't get monopolized? Um, and, and to points what, with, with the architecture of Nantes as well, IoT, yes, you, you can kind of do that there. But I think there's this, as we said, each show those three, three diagrams. I think the evolution will be how we are now, maybe uh, uh, decentralized, then going to distributed world, and how do we step everyone in there without a big player just taking it over? Because we really do have an opportunity, I believe, right now to do this if we do it right. And, and that's where government, I feel, will come in really importantly to say, no, uh, company X, you are not going to post all the hospitals, agents in the NHS. Because you have a decentralized system, but if they're pinging it all off and doing the best deal, then it makes no difference. It, it's you just in the exact same situation. And, and that's where I, I think we need to be really careful. Have a vibrant open market where it's competitive, and then the end user services are the drivers, and that's the adoption, so you're giving better services to the end users as opposed to the technologists and the end users having to work around the technology, which is, I've, I've seen that so many times as an end user, as a, as a doctor of electronic health records, it, it makes no sense because it actually does put patients at risk sometimes. No, you have yeah. two things. Two things I want to say about interoperability. So it's a nice way to check around. So the things that we have to be wary of. So when it comes to like the data itself you can exchange, there's interoperability standards. So uh, fire over there. The mistakes we've made in the past have been so I've been on some of the open air and fire modeling. The mistakes we've made in the past are that there are international standards, and we've come along and said, let's make our own special measure. It kind of breaks the interoperability at an international level. I think we've got to stop that. Um, and I'm working, hopefully, now with the HR7 group and OMG on trying to embed that within what I'm working on. But there's, there's a bigger issue that's at play here when we say all these blockchains will interoperate. Now we know that the different systems between different hospitals, they don't even have a blockchain, they have SQL databases, very simple things, and trying to get them to interoperate is blowing up. Now if you say, build a million different blockchains and we'll get them to interoperate, not only do you have that data semantic interoperability, now you're going to start thinking about token economics, how the miners work, incentivization, all of that. And I think it's, we're going to end up, although it sounds like a great idea to say, million blockchains, that'll help us scale, that'll help innovation. It puts us in exactly what every business starts off with, where you try many different approaches, and you now have to get all those pieces to work together. But, but I, I don't think they're concerned about that, in some respect. I mean, it's, uh, it's oh, no, what, they're, what they're saying is we don't want a dominant blockchain product player like Google, or yeah, no, Facebook coming up, or so I no, I'm not, I'm not arguing with, with, with what what their approach. I'm just saying, and these are things we should learn. Pick out a million blockchains, well. Debate and we certainly don't want to run a procurement to choose what. <laughs> <laughs> and we just have a different perspective. Okay, interesting point, sir. Uh, but uh, can I open it up to the audience? Because I'm sure they'll have some more questions for you. Um, can we kick off? Well, I'll kick off with the gentleman here with the blue tie, and then I'll come to you. And then, anyone else? Uh, hello, my name is Andy Varley. I'm the Director of Research and Development from a medical device company called Owen Mumford, and I'm a self-declared uh, blockchain naive um, <laughs> individual. So my question may be naive as well, but I wanted to point out another possible opportunity. Um, I agree with a great deal of what the speakers have said so far. Um, I think it's been very interesting, and I, I think the trajectory that's being described is important. I think it's inevitable that 
the patient will become the center of, of information. I think that, that will become an inevitability in a lot more data than just healthcare data, but it's likely that healthcare data will lead that because of its particular sensitivity. Um, the, the opportunity that I believe from blockchain or, or from technologies that are similar um, could accrue from that um, is actually one that's interesting for, for, for industry as well in terms of leveling the playing field for, for industry. At the moment, uh, we're, we're involved in, in, we're sort of entering the digital healthcare space inevitably, all, all businesses have to do that at the moment. And frankly, there's a war for patients' data going on right now. There's a battle for patients' data going on, and everybody wants to own it. It's also being accelerated with pharma industry, particularly because of the need for the drive towards outcome-driven medicine. And so pharma industry is demanding more data in order to be able to establish proof of, of outcome. Um, one of the things that I think blockchain may offer is, is it, it kind of re-democratizes um, the, the whole environment associated with data. It de-emphasizes the, the business. It takes the Amazon and the Google. It disintermediates the Amazons and the Googles um, from, the, from the, 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 um, that position. I think that's, they're winning the battle on healthcare data at the moment. Um, for me, it puts us in a position where startups, mid-caps, large businesses, everybody can can work within an environment where that data is distributed. So coming to my question, um, does the panel think that the NHS, rather than being a kind of uh, receiver of this, could be more of a proactive facilitator of the environment that, that could be created um, for that healthcare data? Okay, Ashley, we'll, we'll take another couple of questions from the panel. Thank yeah, it's kind of riffing on, on oh, sorry, what you said there. So your name? Yeah, my name is uh, Matt Lucas. Um, I'm uh, in the blockchain team for uh, IBM. Um, so we've spoken a lot about user ownership of data, of healthcare data, and putting the user in control, the patient in control of the data that's owned about them. Uh, and blockchain, as we know, is very good uh, as a technology for doing things like verifiable credentials that you mentioned there, about giving you cryptographic proof over a set of facts and puts the, the user in control, as I said. But if Brexit and Trump have taught me one thing, it's that proof and trust are not the same thing. Right? You can prove something until you're blue in the face, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people will trust it. Okay? So I guess my, my question to the panel is, how do we go about the social debate that underpins the fact that people don't trust technology? So we can, we can say, and I, you know, I know I could build in IBM, I have to build a, um, an, an electronic medical record system that ensures that I can see that part of my medical history, you can see that part, the government can see that, the insurer can see that, and so on and so on and so on. And I know that from a cryptographic proof point of view, it will work. However, trying to convince my 80-year-old mother, or whoever, that that system works, is a completely different social debate. And, and that's why I like your thoughts on it. Okay, we've got that. that that's, that's pretty good. So we've got the two questions about the NHS as an enabler and about the, the question of trust and technology. So maybe if the panel wants to answer that, then we can come back to your project. Yes, yeah. yeah, so uh, from, from our perspective, as I said, we, we tend to focus on product rather than personal uh, or sensitive data as it were under data protection laws. The, the NHS, I think, from our perspective, has an extremely important role because it's taxpayers' money, right? And they need to use that money in the most efficient way. They need to make sure that money is spent not on administration and bureaucracy and, and you know, other uh, things, but it's actually for the welfare of the country's citizens. And having blocked interoperable blockchains or ways of interacting with data so that, uh, for example, if it's a medical device and it's not in guise but it's in the Whittington Hospital, rather than ringing up the supply and asking him to send new uh, devices, he could actually just bring it down from the hospital up the road. And that's the kind of promise that we can kind of fulfill. Um, as you know, in terms of stock control, inventory control, it's about limiting the time on shelves. In America, for example, they waste something like four billion every year of drugs being expired on shelves because people just don't know where they are. Right? I'm sure it's a similar situation here, whether it's drugs or, or, or medical devices. And we can, if we take a coordinated but commercially competitive approach to it, bring real savings to these large institutions which serve a very important 
function for society generally. And I think the promise is seen more uh, kind of like in the US with the FDA pushing for it um, than, than the government, for example. Um, I think we see it more in the emerging markets because their budgets are so restricted that they want their citizens to have benefits um, than, than perhaps we do in some of the European countries. Um, on the patient data, unfortunately, I'm not the best qualified to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, okay. so, I mean, do you want to? Yeah, so the social point really interests me because um, I've done a lot of work. Actually, the technology has driven my philosophical social. Yeah. Because ultimately, um, there's a transition period because we're not. And this is, I think, and I think now we're talking about it, there's this blockchain bubble. It has to be binary. You can tell the switch, it's got to be this way or not. And it's not. It's an and. Uh, it, it's, it's not an all. So there's systems here that might work. And your mother want it, might want it in a centralized silo. And she should if she can understand it, right? Now we can say there's a new way to do it if you want it. At the moment, there's no option. Um, the societal bit, uh, it's really interesting, and that's why I, the use case of, I see myself as being a doctor as a very privileged role because people trust me very easily, right? We're, we're up at the high 90s in terms of the trust rate of along with nurses. And, and I've been doing some modeling about adoption of this and how in society I, I sign someone to say you can have a mortgage. They say, can you go to your doctor as a trusted doctor? So you've got this trust in here. We're, we're looking at, what does that say in the UK, but engaging with refugees and how do you give identity like this almost trust multiple where you cascade this trust that's given into me by multiple organization and i give that to someone else and then that lets that lets them build it up so you've got this and then once you can see it how do you how do you i trust my doctor if my doctor's using this technology then can i use it that, that that's the modeling we we're looking at and seeing because i've had a relationship with my gp over 15 20 years and now he's saying actually this i'm using this to do my thing do you want to do and that we don't know, so that's how you, how I, how I. Okay. I, think I, think the, I think the two topics are very interrelated. Mm. So it's, it's about trust, and when you trust a big corporation versus the, the government. Actually, at a, at a wider scale, I don't think any blockchain gets rid of trust. From you. What it does is give you an assurance of integrity. Now, you're still going to say, if I say, oh, I trust who you are, well, someone had to assure that he was a doctor. So you're still trusting someone. It's not a machine saying that. You still have to have trust in someone. But this gives us the opportunity to, to separate the trust process from the person who owns the platform. I think that's very important. Because right now, there, there are very few companies that can provide that at scale. And they will de facto become the trust providers. Whereas this says, OK, it's a level playing field. Now you prove by yourself that you are a trustworthy organisation that we should listen to, and now you become the people that we look at. But there's a separate issue in terms of UX or user experience, where yeah, I, I, I don't think people need to go and learn the blockchain. I don't think that no one wants to do that. I don't think anyone should. It's exactly like you use the web now. If I go and put some credit card details, the first thing I'd look for is the, the lock symbol in green. I think there's got to be little visual cues like that for people to learn. But separate to that, I think institutions that I'd much rather have with this democratically voted in institutions controlling that trust in the future. Okay, lovely. Um, we can take some more questions for this health section if uh, anyone's got any questions. Okay, take this gentleman here, then the gentleman at the back, and then anyone else? Okay, do you want to kick off? Yeah, uh, hello, I'm Shiva Gadwal, I'm the CEO of MyRFID, it's a decentralized identity management platform, and I'm also president of the Government Blockchain Association, London. Uh, so what we have discussed here is about basically how we are sourcing health data, how we are storing health data, and how we are uh, transacting health data, right? But we, what we haven't kind of spoken about is, is basically how we are securing it, what is the ownership, and secondly, how do we monetize it, right? Because what is happening is like uh, different uh, industries or, or different organizations, they, they actually they have a lot of data stored uh, within their systems in silos or may, may be connected, but then they are making money out of, of those systems. And the, the, un, until unless we answer the question around ownership, uh, the, the end user who basically, who, for example, a patient, right, where the data belongs to the patient, that is the first question you can answer, then who is the owner of that data? Secondly, if there's monetizing or this, there's a commercial use, then whether the end user is getting some benefit, financial benefit out of that or not, right? And lastly, 
with so many data breaches happening across the world, right? Every big corporate is losing data, right? And, and so how do we ensure that even with these blockchain solutions or basically, how do we ensure that they, they, they work together and the data is secured and then it's, it's basically owned by a specific user and it's being monetized and the user gets benefits. Okay, thank you. The gentleman, Frank. Carl, my, my startup is easier. Um, my name is Gilbert Verdi and uh, I'm ex-HMG. I introduced the government to blockchain in 2008 when I was at Treasury. Uh, in 2015, I was the Chief Security Officer at the Department of Health and I founded the ISO standard for, for blockchain because I foresaw these problems coming from the health sector of what's happening with interoperability. So 2015, we started working on ISO and there's another three years to, to complete that. So I chaired that for the UK. What, I'm, what I'd like to ask is, these problems are solvable. There's a lot of technology, there's a lot of innovation that happens in this space. I think we need the government to champion this and to embrace technology. It seems we're all waiting for things to happen. We're not doing it. And my, my time in government, I, I, I was in the Department of Health in Australia for two years, and we solved these problems. We had the remit, we had the minister's backings, we had the money, and we solved all these problems from an e-health perspective, and it worked. And, and at the end of the day, citizens have their own patient's data. They can see who accesses what, who looks at your data, and you can control that. And that's really possible, but it just needs that, that step to get behind it. So I think it's time to do it and stop just thinking about others. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Just to follow on, well, actually, from the reference to, to standards, so I'm from Thomas Pearson from British Standards Institution, <laughs> and really just uh, a call out to say that there are, there is opportunity to get involved in directly contributing to international standards. It is something, it's not an arcane, weird group you have to have a secret handshake to get into. People can both be active members of committees and contribute and comment on drafts and standards and then those. So, People talking about wanting to get involved, please do come forward, get involved, and contribute to both at those where we do need a national variation, but where really we're also contributing directly to the international standards. That's all we're Thanks for that. So, our panel, would you like to, to comment on those, those issues that have been raised? Well, it seems, it seems to be around, around data. <laughs> My point would be I think that the, the earlier question was, you know, my five year old grandma might not want to. Expose the data, which is a classic. The age group, average age group of Facebook users is 45. Right? Everyone else is on Snapchat, etc. And they're used to having a lot of their data already on um, in public pub display. So I think generally people are getting used to having a lot of their data. I'm not saying that that, uh, that excuses the fact that they can be data used. In terms of data mining, um, I, I think people underestimate the benefits that data can provide, not just from a commercial perspective, but also from some of the clinical uh, perspective and the treatment perspective. So yes, data should be protected, but in terms of allowing anonymized data to be used for research purposes, I think it would be very wrong to prevent that, because there are many benefits from doing data analysis to help society generally. Yeah, no, I, I think that, yeah, data and ownership, again, I'm it's, this is big. I think this is something policy has to really look at what data is. I don't feel if it's a property, you could easily gain the system, and then you're going to be. So if I didn't have enough money, I might pretend to go to hospital, so I get blood tests, so I generate data, so I get money. So you do. You, you need to start looking at the consequences if you, if you say data is a, is, is a property. It has property like aspects. I actually think it's a human right. We generate data all the time, right? And and. There is monetization in it, but then some of the rare diseases, data, who's going to put the value in the data? Is it, is it commercially driven by markets, or is it, should it be driven by need for humanity? Okay, that's, that's two different conversations and debate. I think if you make data like property, it's going to be driven by commercialized institutions. Um, and we might not be doing society a benefit, and actually might be having a negative impact on the people who need healthcare the most. Uh, people who have said to the ID to me, oh, I can't afford healthcare, but this would help people who can't afford it because they can generate more data and we can do whatever we want with their data. So that means if you're rich, is your data more protected than if you're poor? It, you can start getting into loads of interesting dynamics and, and I think there needs to be a lot of thought because when I started four years ago, I thought, yeah, very simple, data, the farm companies would love to know what I prescribe and then I could sell it on and make money myself as an individual. But 
<laughs> when you start thinking about it, it's a lot more complex than that, just simple solution. And, and there is a value for everyone to commercialize it, but to, to win the right way. And I think that will take a lot of thinking about and, and a collaborative approach. Now remember that for, for cancer patients in particular, you know, matching up one donor to another is all on the back of data, and the best and easiest way to do it is electronically. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with it. I'm talking about transparency. Forget it. That's happy. Sure. Right. 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 <laughs> okay, but thanks, thanks very much for that. Maybe uh, if we could just turn, perhaps, Phil <coughs> for, for the last last comment from the perspective of NHS England, because one of the things that's sort of crossing my mind is that how would you quantify the potential financial and human benefits of blockchain as applied to the NHS? So uh, I don't know whether you've got views on that or the other aspect. Do I so have for comments? I don't know why. Seven o'clock. She's voting on something different. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. The moment has arrived. The, uh, so we'll find out. What is it? Fifteen minutes. The, um, so what I was hearing, which is helpful, is the need for a more proactive approach. Whether it's with emerging standards, what new standards could arrive, um, so that there is a, an effort outside of the, um, the NHS to design uh, an ecosystem that includes all the parties and issues that we've been mentioning, that then the NHS can plug into this designed, I'll call it fabric. Um, so rather than expect the NHS, as we focus on, sorry about that, <laughs> on improving one by one the APIs for GPs or the APIs for a hospital with the fire standards. That's our day job, to ask us and expect us to succeed in designing this wider ecosystem and fabric. We can participate, but don't expect us, we, I don't think we can succeed in doing that. So what I'm seeing is um, this concept of a more proactive approach um, of others helping to design this fabric that we can then participate in which will drive the financial benefits. We are, we are a participant in a wider fabric, we're having to fund and, and um, that, that, whole, that, that, that whole ecosystem. Um, and that the, that fabric and that ecosystem is there to benefit the individual patient as well as the other actors, whether it's the GP, whether it's the, 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 the researcher that's trying to improve the, uh, the the qualification of a cohort and testing of, of a particular drug or, or device. Um, to make the data more fluid, we can see how we can engineer those, those improved outcomes for better research, better adoption, to drive uh, better health outcomes as well, as well as financial outcomes. It needs this design effort that we've been sort of touching on, but it needs somebody, to, somebody or somebody to help drive the leadership of that and the design effort of that the NHS then can then participate in. I think it's, it would be a lot easier to sell as well the benefits of blockchain if, in, in political terms if you could make it clear to the government what the benefits would be to the, to the users and the financial benefits but also the human benefits. So I hear what you're saying about structures and, but, it's, but if you want to actually move this forward you have to make the case to government that this is actually going to improve people's lives and the economic environment to do. But... Um, yeah, and, and we can give you evidence on particular instances of this use case, whether it's a doctor use case or a patient use case. We can give you that, but that's where we, you, to cook up a particular trial to prove that blockchain is of value for a doctor or a patient, that's a big effort. We can do that. We can prove it in Liverpool. We can prove it in London, as we have been doing. We can put that on the table, but it's got to be then uh, taken on board by this wider design effort. Yeah. Point taken. Well, thank you very much for that, and thanks very much to our panel for your uh, contributions, and uh, thanks to the audience for your questions and comments on, on that section. I think important issues have been raised, government standards, uh, regulations, the vibrancy uh, of the marketplace, interoperability, uh, the NHS as, as a neighbour, the, the issue of trust that was raised as well, and uh, the quest questions of data ownership. These are all sort of important issues that uh, have to be taken forward in the, in the future. to move to the next
section which is on the uh, on energy and the environment, and I'd like to ask uh, Marcia Zafar, the director of issues and monitoring and innovation of the World Energy Council, to kick us off on that. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I work at the World Energy Council. I'm headquartered here in London. Uh, the council is a not-for-profit member organization with 92 member countries around the world and over 20 corporate partners. Um, what is blockchain? Uh, simply put, is a distributed ledger technology which provides a platform for the management and transaction of data. According to our research, which I will get into in a bit, uh, blockchain's benefits are transparency, traceability, and its ability to facilitate the push towards a decentralized electricity system. Um, the open question, however, is can it revolutionize the way residential consumers receive and consume electricity? In 2018, uh, the Council's global survey of energy leaders identified blockchain as a critical uncertainty. They knew that there was something big about it, they just didn't, they, they needed more information about what blockchain is. So consequently, the council with our partner PwC interviewed 39 companies, regulators from all over the world, and related organizations to understand the maturity of blockchain technology and energy, and also to understand its potential and its possible impediments. We published our findings in 2018, in October, and found the following. One, technological feasibility and scalability will be fixed over time as pilots are being developed and we, we learn uh, and the market learns about those pilots. Two, blockchain and energy is in its infancy. 85% of those interviewed who had pilot projects said they were in early stages and their pilots not mature yet. And finally, what we found was that the full promise of blockchain is very much dependent on reframing regulation in energy and for large scale customer engagement. However, there are existing blockchain applications that can bring immediate optimization for the existing system. So for the rest of my remarks, I would like to separate them into two sections. First, I would like to go over some of the myths surrounding, block, uh, surrounding this enabling technology. And it's important to note that blockchain is an enabler. It's not the change itself, but rather it enables the change. Secondly, I would like to highlight one blockchain application that once deployed can help the current electric system and also touch upon peer-to-peer -peer trading in the energy system. So myths. Uh, blockchain is Bitcoin. Uh, blockchain is not Bitcoin. Bitcoin was created in 2009 and is a cryptocurrency application of blockchain. Whereas blockchain technology as the underlying protocol has many different applications which I'll get into. Blockchain is energy intensive. Uh, Bitcoin is extremely energy intensive because the way they're using blockchain, uh, there are other technologies that the market developed in 2017 uh, that use far less um, energy and, and need far less computing power. So these are, there are other myths, but I think these are the two big ones. And next, I would like to go over two use cases here in London. Uh, that we studied as part of our exploration in this area. Uh, one, Electron, a UK-based startup, has been working towards the creation of a new digitalized energy marketplace, able to include smaller distributed energy resources, and that's the key. Blockchain can allow distributed energy resources to play a bigger role in the electricity market. And the way Electron's um, product, the energy marketplace, would work is smaller generators behind the meter can be seen by the system operator and can thus participate in the market. And Electron is, Electron is currently at proof of concept stage and estimates that will be deployed in the UK within the next 12 months. Uh, the next area, blockchain, the next application which garners the most hype in, in the energy sector is peer-to-peer -peer trading, uh, P2P. Uh, the, and this is the prospect of blockchain technology that would allow transactive energy to happen, to upend basically the existing framework of the electricity sector. With the right business model and the right regulatory framework, blockchain's ability to make transactions faster, simpler, and cheaper can allow for wider participation into the energy market down to individual households. Uh, basically, we live in a world where we are in a 
centralized, vertically integrated company, energy companies, and uh, with uh, with blockchain, there's a there's a possibility that we can break that up and, and make the uh, the system more um, distributed and more democratized. A London-based startup, uh, Verb, is currently hosting a live P2P blockchain trial in an East London estate where solar panels have been installed on the roofs of the, of the flats. So what's stopping this enabling technology to reach full potential? What we found from our study and interviews of various energy players is that regulation and customer engagement are the key factors in how far blockchain can transform the grid. Uh, while regulators will need to update rules and regulations to allow for a more distributed grid and allow for consumers to become prosumers, the biggest challenge is customer engagement. Will customers want this? Um, a fully scaled P2P market is dependent on residential customers becoming prosumers. In terms of regulation, what we learned from these interviews is that at the very least, there needs to be revised definitions of key terms, such as the consumer, who the consumer is, is there a consumer, and other relevant terms that need to be defined. We found that uh, regulators must clearly state their philosophy and long-term vision. Uh, do regulators support these centralized, uh, vertically integrated companies, energy companies, or is it more a push towards distributed energy resources? Um, and then in the decentralized uh, market, there will be a need for um, cybersecurity oversight, and, and what we found from both reg interviewing regulators as well as companies is that regu regulators need to start building the talent internally to, have, to be able to do adequate oversight of, uh, of cybersecurity. So in concluding my remarks, I will say this. The future outlook for energy blockchain is highly promising and also highly uncertain. Promising because it is fueling a rethinking of the energy value chain. Um, and uncertain because we don't know how and whether customers will engage. Um, in 2017, Ofgem did a study of um, customer choice. And in the UK, uh, as, you, as you know, customers have a choice to change their energy service providers. And by and large, they haven't. Uh, the study shows that if you do change it, and if you change your tariff by choice, which you have, you can have uh, a savings of up to 300 pounds a year. 60% of customers have decided not to take that savings. So that's a concern for a P2P blockchain. But certainly there's ex there are many other pilots that can, that can bring uh, efficiency into the existing system. Thank you, Marcia. Now if I can turn to Alistair Mark, who is Director General of Blockchain Climate Institute, Chair of the Committee on Energy, Climate Change and Green Finance and the British Blockchain Association. Yeah, your Lordship, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, thank you for inviting me to give evidence here at, uh, at the House of Commons uh, this afternoon at a very historic moment. Uh, we have, uh, you have indeed uh, proposed three very big questions around the deployment of blockchain in tackling energy and environmental challenges. So, let me uh, be uh, succinct in my responses. So, firstly, in view of the mining process of cryptocurrencies being energy intensive, I believe that um, uh, this will become things of the past very soon. Today it is uh, actually the proof of work algorithms uh, which causes high energy consumption. Tomorrow it will be proof of stake that largely um, address these concerns uh, with very energy efficient blockchain because mining would no longer be necessary. Therefore, uh, this question would be out of our agenda sooner or later. Secondly, we can envision the extensive use of uh, blockchain in the energy sector. Uh, blockchain enables direct energy transactions uh, between entities um, across the value chain, uh, including the smallest of uh, electricity users and generators. This is uh, uh, what we call a distributed energy generation or community energy. This innovation approach differs from the current uh, centralized energy system, where electricity comes from licensed suppliers or big six only. I don't want to repeat what my World Energy Council colleague has uh, already shared about the energy sector, but if all of us still remember uh, the community energy strategy documents released by the former Department for Energy and Climate Change DEC uh, in 2014, I believe now is about time for the government or base to update it uh, with blockchain elements. 
Um, thirdly, um, blockchain could be a, a very powerful tool to help tackle many environmental challenges, including the mobilization of green finance, prevention of plastic waste in a circular economy, and carbon trading. For green finance, uh, blockchain can create asset-level databases and proceeds monitoring mechanism for both the public and private sector institutions. Emerging digital technologies like artificial intelligence, data analytics, remote sensors, and satellite imagery, etc., can feed precise and system-wide uh, data uh, into a blockchain that assures the investors that greenhorn proceeds have really gone to um, finance um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the green projects. Such as uh, afforestation. Uh, for the prevention of plastic waste, uh, which is a heated topic nowadays, uh, blockchain can address it uh, by uh, stimulating a genu genuinely circular economy uh, among manufacturers. Today, um, circular economy business models are still primarily focused on the firm, relegating the end consumers to roles such as subsequent separation of products or waste for reuse or refuse uh, collection. <laughs> The event of blockchain offers great opportunities to empower consumers to engage and participate uh, more actively in product reuse and recovery processes through um, uh, four functions, be they in increasing resource efficiency, resource tracking, resource pricing, and attaching both financial and environmental value to cryptocurrency. Finally, for uh, carbon trading, a blockchain can tokenize the carbon units uh, in an emissions trading scheme ensuring almost complete uh, transparency, trackability, security, and environmental credibility uh, uh, in the transfers of carbon allowances and issuing of offset credits at considerably low cost. After the MPs are casting um, their vote, Brexit vote tonight, it may be about the right time again to think about if the post-Brexit UK emission trading scheme can be put on the blockchain. Examples of blockchain-based energy and uh, uh, environment projects bound will include some of the you know, written evidence um, to be submitted later on, but the common barriers facing uh, all these blockchain applications um, uh, that uh, the government, parliamentarians, and industry stakeholders have to address is not technicality but a new approach to legislation, regulatory enforcement. We do need to understand in depth um, the five regulatory services that blockchain and wider DLT uh, can deliver. They are uniqueness, validity, consensus, immutability, and lastly, authentication, which we are studying in our environmental law research project recently. It is very important that in a blockchain or smart contract ecosystem, parliamentarians uh, recognize that code is law, or what we call a crypto legal structure. A crypto legal structure will lead to at least three disruptive effects to the regulated environment, including simplification of existing law, emergence of new legal actors, and new patterns of enforcement and regulations. Let me give you a very brief example. In a blockchain-supported emission trading scheme, the carbon registry will become a distributed one that regulators cannot control. The law here should rather regulate the on and off ramps where emissions data is being exchanged. And the on and off ramp here could be what data categories should enter into smart contract and equipment standards. The law should probably also regulate blockchain coders and platform providers instead of usual intermediaries only, not to mention many new legal questions arising. This is just a very brief summary of my answer to your questions. I am ready for your question. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you, Mr. So, um, can I have some questions from our two speakers in the audience? Anyone got a contribution? An observation: the the myths um, are the same as what we're seeing from the health sector. And I was also struck when you described the you know a couple of use cases, SMEs, the proof of concept, that methodology very similar, um, uh, maybe pushing it on peer-to-peer -peer trading, but I just take the example of, of NABIN with um, cancer. So if you're trying to look after a, a cohort of patients uh, that you're testing positive for cancer, you want to run the radiology test, you want to find who's got the best AI algorithm to tell you uh, about the tumour, who can help uh, locate the best clinicians to do an MDT review to decide on the treatment plan, um, that's where we want to be able to find the right doctors, bring them together, make faster decisions. There are parallels, and I, and I think this is the, I guess my question is, recognise where there are parallels between what look like orthogonal sectors, um, 
and that help inform how, when I say the um, uh, how the task force or, 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 or the, the APPG uh, can get their heads around how to help these sectors in common ways. Yeah, excellent. Actually, I've got I've got a, a quite a couple of questions from our, our panelists. Um, Mark, yeah, you mentioned about peer-to-peer -peer lending, and some people have said to me one of the benefits of actually blockchain in, in the digital ledger technology is how it can establish trust between um, uh, traders in the sense that you, you know you can't you can't fiddle around the the, the the ledger because it's been established and it's already there. So in a way, do you think that peer-to-peer -peer lending um, using blockchain could actually increase the level of trust uh, in business? And can it also reduce the costs, potential costs, because you're actually cutting out the middle people, aren't you, that often take a cut, especially in, you know, I'm from a UK energy minister, trade minister, and uh, you know, a lot of, there's a lot, of, there are a lot of commissions that are made when uh, commodities change hands. So that's a question from Marzia. For, for Alistair, you mentioned that crypto regulated environment, but I mean, that's one of the big queries, isn't it, about um, crypto and blockchain at the moment. The fact is that it's not highly regulated, and um, particularly a lot of investors um, get, get a bit nervous that there is lack of regulation. How do you think that can that whole issue of regulation and making the environment a safer place for retail investors and others can be overcome? Well, so, in ter thank you. In terms of the energy industry, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer trading, um, uh, it, it can certainly, you know, blockchain can certainly get get the market into that transactive energy world where you and I could be trading our, our access to energy. Uh, right now, obviously, the laws don't allow that. And um, will it make it cheaper? The idea is that, yes, it should make it faster, it should make it cheaper. It's a level of automation. How much do you want to automate the energy industry? And the regulators will have a bigger role or have an evolved role of making sure that they are the, the police or the reparation in this area. Um, the reason sometimes I think people are skeptical is that even though this can be automated, that when certain, when it's, it's based in, on, on smart contracts and when certain conditions are met, then the trading happens. Um, how, how you and I will, will accept that in the energy industry, it, it's, it's a big question. I think maybe uh, in, in the future, once we go through the different stages, and make it easier for the for the customer, um, create some sort of service rather than. Um, I, I guess I, I would say this that it's difficult in the energy industry because we see that we as uh, as citizens of the world see energy as a basic commodity, not as a service. And I think when we make that change, we can see a P two P world, uh, and blockchain can, can certainly help. Okay, thanks, So the government's been defeated, so the domain is lost today. Okay, which is not unexpected. What's <laughs> 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 well, that got to do with blockchain? <laughs> well, it could have a lot to do with it, I guess. But um, as so it sounds to like we are going to have a hot Brexit, so we let, let us see if blockchain can help. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I. Uh, I recognise that um, a lot of regulators or legislators are pretty nervous uh, about um, uh, the missing um, uh, fish from the net uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, monitoring or regulating um, uh, blockchain supported transactions. So uh, definitely we need to recognise um, uh, the emergence of new legal elements and new legal actors which um, have um, to be looked after in our new regulations. Uh, for example, um, uh, in a blockchain supported um, carbon trading system, uh, it uh, renounced um, the current trading model where carbon allowances are transferred based on the uh, XMT regulations in induced trust and exposed court review. Instead, uh, it is a technology based solution um, uh, on with a consensus algorithm giving notes the trust that transfer executed and recorded accurately. Uh, it uh, actually requires um, uh, new legal elements uh, in um, uh, any registry uh, regulations, either in the EU or uh, in the UK uh, after Brexit, that uh, prohibits uh, any party from taking control of the majority of the notes, uh, and hence uh, the validating process um, uh, of all those carbon units. 
and um, uh, yeah, and uh, we uh, went um, if if um, there are new um, bills uh, introduced either uh, by the government or uh, the members of the parliament uh, later on, um, we definitely need to um, uh, answer a few um, outstanding questions about the use of um, smart contracts uh, in both um, the, uh, the UK ETS in the future uh, or some other uh, environmental um, uh, policy framework, including, uh, for example, can a computer coded smart contract capture all the elements of a traditional contracts such as uh, force merger events uh, in the real world uh, and uh, who will be held uh, legally responsible for the flaws uh, of the uh, emission trading blockchain uh, or uh, the, the DAO uh, and finally um, uh, if, it is a, uh, if it is the uh, CUPDA who is um, showing legal responsibilities uh, outside of our jurisdiction which is the applicable law um, uh, that will um, govern the legal responsibilities which uh, we expect these uh, foreign companies um, uh, to um, uh, um, to take uh, as part of this legal crypto legal structure can there be some decentralized arbitration mechanism which uh, authority also recognize um, to resolve um, this um, uh, potential dispute uh, coming out of say uh, Mr. Box uh, from a smart contract so um, these are uh, just some of the outstanding questions that might disrupt um, the um, the current uh, uh, the enforceability of the current um, uh, laws and regulations yeah, that we have to address together. Okay, I have a very quick question. Not from this industry, but are you saying that it's illegal to set up your own microgrid, off-grid, and transact between? It's not. It's not illegal to set up your own microgrid. Because your your microgrid is gonna it's self-sufficient will be serving you. Yeah. Um, I think. But with, with your neighbors as well, if you set up a You cannot sell to the neighbor. You can sell back to the Oops. system operator, and and. So in the U.S., for instance, we have net metering. I think we have here in, in the U.K. as well. So if you have solar panels as a residential customer and you want to sell back the excess, you sell it back to the system. You know, you, right now, the laws are against you selling it to your neighbor. But if I set up my own wires to my neighbor, what's stopping me? Uh, there are actually laws. Can, can I just say this? Um, the current system is that if you have surplus energy, you sell it back to the grid. And in fact, there's a, there's a bit of controversy at the moment because previously that was subsidised and you could make a profit by selling it to the grid. But the, the government is talking about axing those subsidies. So in fact, if you were creating excess energy, say through solar or whatever, you would just be giving that excess energy to the grid for nothing, for free. You would be giving the grid free energy. Um, so that, that's a bit controversial at the moment, but that's certainly the position. Anyway, okay. That, that, um, okay, we can... If you very brief, it's just an observation. Sort of it's an observation. I'd just like sorry, to say. Who, to, uh, sorry, my name is uh, Tony McGurn. I'm a uh, founder of CryptoCycle. Yeah. We're an environmental blockchain company. Um, it's just something that Phil said um, about the NHS. Um, we have produced a deposit return scheme based on blockchain, okay, which was quite easy for us to do because we were working to rules that, and, and a paper that was produced by DEFRA. Um, but it seems to me that the NHS. Um, and, and in terms of medical blockchains, it seems to be more like the Wild West. Everybody go off and do your own thing. We'd all like to use it, but nobody wants to take full control of it. Um, and so what the NHS is saying, well, we'd like somebody to do that, but you could end up with a megalomaniac in charge. <laughs> all right, we know what. <laughs> yeah. If I could just bring in the little yeah. back. Hi, know. Ruth Hillary, I'm a sustainability consultant. I wanted to ask whether, once you did your study from the world, um, Energy Council, whether you found there was much appetite in other jurisdictions outside UK, US, maybe in uh, some of the developing countries to look at actual peer to peer structures. Um, there was a, I think there were anywhere, was there an appetite to really look at this? I think there's a lot of appetite to look at it, especially in developing countries where they can leapfrog, leapfrog the existing system. And I, and I don't want to insinuate that there is not an appetite in the US or in, uh, in Europe. There is, uh, it's just these systems are very established. And we have to bring a business model to regulators to show that this is how the business model enabled by blockchain can, uh, can work. And at this point, it's a little too early. And I think we have the hype of blockchain. We don't have the right business models, which we will have. Uh, which mo the market should have in the, in, the, in the very near future. Okay, thanks very much. I think I need to wind up my 
thank our panelists, Marzia and Alistair, and our earlier panelists as well in the uh, health sector. I think a lot of important issues have been raised uh, in, the, in these sessions. Um, it is clearly blockchain is an evolving space. There are a number of issues that will be cropping up and we'll be dealing with both uh, as consumers and as, uh, as government and as parliament. But I think clearly uh, there are exciting applications both in the healthcare sector and in the energy sector as we've heard uh, this evening. Finally, if I get as some yeah. uh, announcements just before we go. I just, I just want to say that we ask uh, all uh, events givers to provide uh, 250 words plus, uh, but also with a limited length, uh, the key points. But everyone, so we have also the written evidence, but everyone in this room here who wants to provide further written evidence, you can provide kind of from a guest perspective in evidence that will be included in the evidence collection. So if you, we can be, be, be physically constrained to only put have a, a few people to talk, but I know everybody got a lot to say, so you're very welcome to submit your 250 words plus minus uh, within this very reason, uh, you are on evidence. That's one thing. And, but, if, but if you want to do so, you probably should do that uh, best before Friday, or uh, it's, it's so you can process it before the next meeting. Uh, the other thing um, I want to say is that uh, now we are doing blog to go over and we are now very sport. I know your progress is far ahead on health and we could also do things on energy. So actually I think this year after this meeting here where it's all kind of press, it is actually a very good opportunity to uh, see if we can establish some of these blockchain for government meetings where they can learn from each other because when I hear here what you heard from sport is not so different. <laughs> and the uh, health and energy also has things in common, so maybe we should also see if we could get some uh, a more kind of collaboration on the different task forces. And okay. then we can get back to that. And thanks to the audience for coming along. Thanks so much for the